getting into 2 Peter this morning. We just finished 1 Peter last week. 2 Peter is not a continuation of 1 Peter. It's a second letter from Peter to his churches. Okay, so that's what that means by 2 Peter. It's a shorter book, shorter letter. And from what we can tell anyway, this was probably written after 1 Peter. It's hard to tell exactly, um, but that's, that's a pretty good uh, assumption we're making is it's written after we don't know how long after pretty soon after probably to the same group of people okay um so basically all the things you knew about the background of first peter apply to second peter generally speaking okay and so we're gonna um just to kind of give you uh, uh peter's reason for preaching this in verses 12 to 15, I'm not going to read it this morning. You can read that on your own. Basically, he tells us his purpose for writing, which is he's reaching an old age. And he doesn't know how much longer he's going to be around. And so he wants to give everyone, all of the, the people in these churches, sort of these are his last words as he sees it, so that they will remember what he taught them. So that even after he's gone, there will be something there for them to read and to be reminded of the gospel and the different things that he had taught them over the years. So he sees this as, at least to some degree, a summary of his kind of life message, okay? Which is really, especially the section we're going to be in this morning, which is verses 1 through 15, really is that. It's a summary. You could even see it as a summary of a lot of the themes in First Peter. But pretty quickly he goes into things like false teachers and other stuff, which we'll get into in the coming weeks. So let's look at these first two, just the first two verses to start with. This is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Okay, so the first thing, thing I want to point out here is that when Peter says to those that have obtained um, a faith of equal standing with ours, he, he's not speaking in kind of a, an arrogant way as if to exclude other Christians of lesser faith. He's not saying like, okay, for those of you who have come up to my level, this is for you. That's not his point. That's not the way the grammar works in the Greek. What he's actually saying is everybody is the same, okay? I'm on your level. God sees us all as the same. Every believer, every Christian, um, God has equipped the same way. You'll see this point made more clearly later, but he, he's saying God's not a respecter of persons. Just because Peter is this great apostle, and he has a lot of notoriety at this time in the life of the church. Despite all that, he doesn't see himself as separate from the people he's writing to. He doesn't see himself as separate from the congregation. He sees himself as being on equal standing with them, okay? That's his point. Okay, look at verses 3 through 4. This is a densely packed. There's lots in this verse. It's amazing. Verses 3 through 4, he says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. If you're in our Wednesday night hermeneutics class, Bible study class, I've been telling you to pay attention to these words like so that, therefore, all right, all those words are important, okay, and it kind of helps you understand this verse. Here's my summary of what he's saying. He's saying that Jesus has given us everything that we need to live a godly life. That's what he means by life and godliness. It's to live this godly life that, is, that, that demonstrates the character of of Christ. He's given us everything we need. The power to live that godly life is not in us, it's through knowing him. It's through the knowledge of Christ. So the more you know him, the more you act like him and look like him. Jesus has called us to be like him and he has promised that we will be like him. So it's not just, hey, be like me. It's I, he promises us that we will 
be like him, which is amazing. This promise to make us like him carries along us along as we take on his characteristics. So I want to look at this phrase, everything for life and godliness, because it kind of has two impacts. One is it's very uh, motivating and empowering, but it's also confrontational because it means that we don't have an excuse, right? He's being both encouraging and confrontational at the same time. He's confrontational in that he's taking away every excuse anyone might have for not living a godly life. Well, God, you didn't give me the ability to do that. And Peter's saying, no, God has given you every single thing you need to live that life. It's also encouraging in that he's encouraging us to have faith that we don't need any more power to live a godly life. You have to, don't have to wait on any additional gift or additional insight or additional power to live this life that he's calling us to live. And he's saying, hey, just believe that, <laughs> right? Because when you believe that, that becomes the power to actually live that way. It has already been granted to you. Jesus has not held anything back from you. The same divine power that saved you, sustains you, and continues to sanctify you. You are not battling yourself by yourself. That's very encouraging. So, no, yes, we don't have an excuse. But at the same time, he's given us everything we need. That's good news, right? So what does he mean by partakers in the divine nature? I think if, if you look at this through a modern lens, it can kind of sound like, like if this verse wasn't here, and I said this in a sermon, some of y'all would look at me funny. Like, are you kind of going weird, new agey? Like, what's going on? Partakers in the divine nature. Like, are you saying we're gods? No, not saying that. Neither is Peter. This idea of the divine nature was a very established idea and phrase in Greek language, literature, philosophy, all going all the way back to Plato. I don't know a lot about Plato, but I know that he used this term a lot and talked about it a lot. This idea of participating in the divine nature was also common, though they used a slightly different word for it in pagan writing. And interestingly enough, Jewish writers also used this expression quite a lot, partaking or participating in the divine nature. So it seems like that what Peter is doing is he's taking a very commonly used phrase at the time, both understood by Jews and Greeks, and those are the two groups of people he's writing to. So it's a smart move. And he's using that to describe what we are becoming as followers of Christ. He's not just generally referring to the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He's talking about human beings sharing in some characteristic of divinity, of God himself. He's saying that we will have more in common with the world of the divine than we have in common with the world of human beings. That's an amazing statement that you will have more in common with the divine world than the human world. That you were made for that, and he created you for that. So what would this look like? What would those divine characteristics be? I think he defines this in some ways. I don't think he's trying to be exhaustive in the next few verses where he gives us a list of characteristics. But if you, start, if you go back in general to Genesis 1.27 where it says we're made in the image of God, I think this is a good starting point. Meaning that the sinful desires in us that are rooted in the world, they have corrupted the image of God in us. God made human beings to reflect and to demonstrate and show what God is like. So that when the world and the universe and the angels look at us, they say, hey, you, you kind of look like God. You remind me of God. Like when people look at my, especially my son, Owen, everybody says he looks like me. It's kind of like that. It's that you remind people of some aspect of what God looks like and what his nature is. And sin came in and it obscured and corrupted that image. Corrupt, corrupted is probably the right word. It's the word that Peter uses right here in these verses. It corrupted that image. And what God is doing is he is resurrecting that image in us and allowing us to escape the corruption of the world, as Peter puts it, so that that image of him is revealed in its fullness. And that is what you are becoming as a Christian, is that full, completed image of God. You're not becoming God yourself. You are becoming an image, a, a perfect reflection 
of what he is like. And so we were made to partake in the divine nature from the beginning. From the very beginning is what you were made to do. And so there's a logical flow to Peter's words here. We're first called by God in verse 3, which involves revealing the knowledge of Jesus. Jesus has revealed himself to us, and as we grow in that knowledge of him, we grow to be more like him, and that image is further revealed. The result of this calling and this revealing of the knowledge of God is that God gives us these promises of holiness. He says, I'm going to make you holy. I'm going to make you look like me. You're going to have characteristics. You're going to share characteristics with me. That's crazy. That's what he's saying. We're going to be like him. And all of this is sourced by his divine power, not ours. And so this this result is that we take on characteristics like him, not so that we complete so completely and fully that we become God, okay, but we become like him. So then Peter gives us a nice list because he knows some of us were going to ask. Look at Second Peter, verses chapter one, verses four through eleven. It says, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fail or fall, excuse me. For in this way there will be you there in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So Peter gives us a list written in very dramatic fashion. I kind of feel like when I read that that he worked on this a lot. <laughs> he worked on that sentence a lot. And these are a list of virtues that should characterize the life of a Christian. This is what he means by partaking in the divine nature, you will have these qualities or at least be increasing in these qualities, as he puts it. This is what he means by the godly life in verse 3. All right, so here's the list. Let's look at the list. I'm going to try to define these as quickly as I can. He says faith. He uses the word faith, which means something closer to faithfulness than what we often think of as faith in Christian language, Okay. It just means being faithful, like consistently obedient and present and doing what God has called you to do um, over the long haul, okay? He uses the word virtue, which is just moral excellence. Knowledge, okay, based on the preceding verses in a couple of places, he's talking about the knowledge of Christ, not just like knowing stuff. He's not even really talking about experience. He's talking about just knowing Jesus, like when you study your Bible, the goal is not to just learn stuff, it's to know God, okay? You're making a study of God himself. And this is what we're after. This knowledge thing is really important to Peter. He repeats this several times. And I've, you know, I always want to point out that your brain is not in opposition to your heart. Like knowing things doesn't somehow diminish the importance of your heart and vice versa. They're both, they're actually, I think they're connected. One, the mind is the gateway to the heart. So he says, knowledge of God is important. And he says, self-control, which is not allowing your inner desires to rule you. Like you are in control. You are in charge of yourself. That's what that means. Steadfastness, that's just perseverance. So that you don't, you don't quit before the race is over. That you persevere all the way to the end. You endure to the end. That's steadfastness. Godliness is piety, which is a term used most often um, by Peter and in the New Testament to describe relationships between people, how you treat other people. 
is what's in view there. Brotherly affection. I like the word kinship better. Um, that's family. It's treating each other as family. This was a weird value in this time, and it kind of is now. That, that We treat family like family, like physical family, but the idea of actually treating people who are not your physical family like family was bizarre to this culture. And he's saying you treat the other fellow Christians like family. This would not have been out of the ordinary in Greco-Roman society. What would have been different is that fellow Christians were treated as physical family and non-Christian physical family were the ones that were the outsiders. Think about how Jesus taught. He taught that the bond we have in Christ is stronger and more significant than the bond even of blood between family members, between physical brothers and sisters. It's why so often the term brothers and sisters was used to talk about fellow Christians that you're not related to by blood. This is how we should feel about each other. We should feel these warm family feelings about each other. If you had a broken family this might be hard for you to get your head around right because you don't have these like warm fuzzies about your physical family so just try to imagine like the you know leave it to beaver or something right and hypothetically speaking if you had those warm fuzzy feelings about your family you should have those same warm fuzzy feelings about your christian family right that's his point this is an emotional thing this is affection okay because he's going to talk about love next that's his next word. So this is not the same. He's talking about affections, what you feel, which is interesting that he's commanding us to feel a certain way. We're not used to that. <laughs> We're used to just, well, my feelings are what they are, and there's some truth to that. But there's also a place for commanding your soul and saying, you will do what I say, even those emotions, which goes back to that idea of self-control. Um, it's a powerful idea if you can put, put some faith into it, right? Okay, so next he says love, he says, love each other. So there is an overlap in meaning of brotherly, brotherly affection and love here. But what he's talking about when he says love, that's agape. That's, that's not just your warm, fuzzy feelings. It's also this idea of love that is demonstrated in what you do, in action. Okay, so it's just the obvious example is Jesus dying for us. He had warm, fuzzy feelings for us. He still has warm, fuzzy feelings for us, but it's, his love is more than that. It's an action that you can see demonstrated. So instead of just warm, fuzzy feelings, which are important, he says love is primarily defined in action. You can look at 1 Corinthians 13 as an obvious example of that and a description of that kind of love. This kind of love is always demonstrated, okay? So he says love each other like family, treat each other like family, and then demonstrate that in the way that you act towards each other. It's one thing to just to say, yeah, we're a family. I mean, how many companies now use that word just flippantly? Welcome to the insert company name here, family, right? It's, and you go, well, I don't feel like this is family, <laughs> and you don't treat me like family, so why are you calling me family? So it's not a, enough just to say family and name only. It has to be in how you walk and live and treat each other. So it's important to point out, Peter actually says we're growing in these qualities. You're not there yet. I mean, I'm certainly not. There's room for improvement. There will always be until we are perfected at either in death or when Jesus returns. They are not immediately evident in their fullness is another way to put it. So these qualities serve as a confirmation, he says, that we have indeed been chosen by God. You have been elected by God. You have been picked out. You have been saved by him. And so I, I think a good metaphor for this is like, well, I don't know if they do this anymore, but um, when you go to like Walmart and you have your receipt, they, make you, they check your receipt at the door as you're leaving, um, which irritates me, <laughs> but that's not, has nothing to do with this sermon. Um, so the receipt is not the payment. The receipt is evidence that you paid, okay? And this is what these things are also, is that it's not that 
you, your good works and the, these great characteristics, these godly characteristics save you, it's that they are evidence that you are saved. And that's exactly how Peter puts it here. He says, check, check your receipt. Like, look at your life. Are you growing in these characteristics? If not, be concerned, <laughs> okay? It doesn't mean you're not a Christian, but you should be concerned, right? And you have to be careful here that you don't kind of take too small of a sample size of your life, okay? Um, if you take a sample size that's 24 hours long of my life, then <laughs> you may not see up an upward trend. <laughs> you may, you might see a downward trend, but if you take a sample size of, well, it depends on how, you know, you want to skew the data, but uh, <laughs> say a year, I don't know, uh, 10 years. The longer you go, the more positive it might seem, or in your case, it might be worse if you take a longer sample size. But you get the idea. Like, you have to bring grace into this. You don't get hyper-analytical about it. But if your life is not, if you're not growing and maturing, then you should be concerned about it. It should worry you. It's not wrong to be worried about that. You look at your life and you see, man, I'm just not, I'm stuck. And I'm not growing in knowledge of God. I'm not growing in self-control. I'm not growing in perseverance. I'm not growing in godliness in the way that I treat other people. I'm not growing in my kinship, affection, for my fellow Christians. I'm not growing in love for my, for my neighbor. I'm not growing in that way. That's concerning. That's what he's saying is like, this is important because it gives you a, a barometer reading of where you're at spiritually. It's terrible to look at how you feel as the barometer reading of how you're doing spiritually, whether you feel close to God or don't. It's so what you look at is you look at actually how you live. That's what Peter's point is. He's always talking about this. He's always, first Peter was about this too. These are the fruits of the evidence of our salvation, not the source of it. This is, Jesus brought up this idea of fruit and then Paul picked it up and ran with it even further, which is this idea that how do you know a tree? What kind of tree you have? Now, if you're really into trees, I'm sure there's lots of ways to know what trees are, right? But for me, who knows nothing about trees, I know if an apple tree is an apple tree, if it has apples on it. I go, ah, must be an apple tree. If it has oranges on it, I'm thinking it's probably not an apple tree, it's an orange tree, right? Or it could be a dying orange tree or a fruitless orange tree, and that's still that's concerning, and Paul talks about that too. And so this is how we look at these, this list, this is how we understand this list and where it fits in with what it, how it connects to our salvation whether or not God has saved us or not and he says look at those things and I think Peter's idea ultimately is that it will give you confidence I think quite often we don't do this enough and we start to think that we're just a big loser and God's not happy with us and we don't get some perspective one of the things that helps me is having someone else in my life like my wife and friends who can say wow I'm I'm really blessed by the way you've grown in this area. It's really cool to see. And to have people in your life that can help you get that perspective is really important. And it keeps you from getting um, hopeless and frustrated. All right, so in conclusion, I love Peter's perspective on godly living. Because he isn't just asking us to be good people for the sake of being good people. He wants us to be good people for the sake of being like God. That's an incredibly powerful idea. Do you realize this is what God chose you for? He made you to look like him. You're not insignificant. All of your significance as a human being comes from this one idea. Is that he created you and fashioned you in your mother's womb for the ultimate purpose, the singular ultimate purpose of revealing to the universe what God is like. And he has promised that he will finish that work in you. He's calling us to take on the character of Christ. And this effort is powered by Christ. Okay, so not to worry. Okay? He's, he's commanded you to be like him, but he's also promised you that he will empower you to be like him. It is effort. It certainly is. 
There's effort involved, but it's grace-filled effort. It's infused with God's mercy and his patience and his grace. He has given you everything you need. He has given you himself. Amen? So I want to pray for you, and I want to encourage you to ponder this list this week. Just pull out your Bible and um, look at this list. Here, I think it was at verse 3. Yeah, verse 3 and 4. And just look at your life and ask God to grow you and mature you in these, this list. You can also go to into Galatians and look at the fruit of the Spirit. That's another great one to look at. And begin to pray into these things for your life. And that's what I want to pray for you right now. So let's pray. God, I ask you to, just by your Spirit, would you just come into all of our lives, not just right now in this moment, but continually day in and day out, that we would be trending upward to be more like you. God, that you would strengthen our faith and our endurance, our self-control. God, that you would help us to grow in our knowledge of you. God, that you would help us to treat each other with affection, with brotherly kinship affection, that we would treat each other like uh, the, the ultimate concept of family. And God, that we would love each other in ways that can be demonstrated towards each other. God, help us and help everyone watching this to do that by your spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, love you guys, and we'll see you next week.